And as I'm introducing my talk, I just want you to have a quick look at the map behind me. Um, this is a map of the Eastern Mediterranean with um, some of the major empires, ancient em empires that were around at the time. I'm going to be mentioning some of these empires um, during my talk, so it's just good for you to all to kind of um, know where um, certain empires are, are located. Um, so, moving on. Now, Cyprus as a geopolitical entity, um, there's so much to talk about it. Um, however, within the context of this, this uh, seminar today, the precursory groups of um, the Turks of Cyprus, I'm going to have to focus more on this. But um, in general terms, there are many reasons why people travel from all over the world to come to Cyprus in ancient times. And the first reason being agriculture. Um, Cyprus has a semi-arid climate. It's ideal to grow all sorts of crops, some of them are listed behind me, and um, it's also ideal for hosting uh, livestock. So the first people to settle on Cyprus um, came for, to exploit its farming potential. Um, but what really put Cyprus on the map in ancient times was its abundance of copper, and especially during the Bronze Age between 3000 BC and 1200 BC, um, copper was highly in demand in the region, and as you know, copper is a key ingredient in making bronze. And actually, the name Cyprus comes from the word copper, and um, some would argue vice versa. Um, I'm not too sure on that one, to be honest, but there is a link there. Um, another thing that made Cyprus um, hot property in ancient times was its potential as a um, trade hub in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, Cyprus was located at a crossroads of many empires, um, Hittites, Assyrians, Phoenicians, um, Egyptians, Persians. They were all trading in the eastern Mediterranean and Cyprus was in the middle of that. It was a peaceful hub um, during that time. So actually Cyprus, you could say, was the Switzerland of the eastern Mediterranean um, in the ancient times. However, this was a very short-lived honeymoon because around um, 1200 BC, at the end of the Bronze Age, um, naval warfare became a thing. In fact, Cyprus was involved in the first historically recorded um, naval battle in history. That was between the Kingdom of Alasia, which was based in Cyprus, and the Hittite Empire, which was based in Anatolia. So Cyprus has really been the crown jewel of the Eastern Mediterranean. Some people call it the star of the Fertile Crescent. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, the first people to set, settle in Cyprus were actually farmers. Um, and these were um, people who um, moved there from Anatolia and the Levant region. So we're talking about modern day Turkey and Syria. However, I have to underline that the people who migrated to Cyprus from what is modern day Turkey, they were not Turks. Um, some nationalists have argued um, against that, but um, from mainstream historical records, they were actually Semitic people, they were Semites, which means that they are related to the modern day people, um, the Hebrews and, and the Arabs. Um, now, the Mycenaeans, this is an important uh, race that I need to mention here. Mycenaeans were people who came from southern Greece. Um, they moved to Cyprus in around the 12th century BC. Um, now I say that they're from southern Greece, from the Peninsula Peninsula, but these people actually arrived in Cyprus not as conquerors, but as refugees. They were fleeing persecution in their homeland um, at the hands of another race of people who came from what is northern Greece today, and they were called the Dorians. Um, however, the first people to actually conquer and colonize Cyprus, according to um, what we know of history, are the Assyrian people. Um, the Assyrian people conquered Cyprus in the 8th century BC, and they came from the Mesopotamian region, which is basically the border of what is Syria and Iraq today. Um, around 200 years later, um, Cyprus was conquered by the ancient Egyptians, they held on to the island for a short time before the Persians from Iran came and took Cyprus and incorporated it into their empire. And um, in the 4th century BC, um, Alexander the Great of Macedonia, and I'm talking about Macedonia as a region, not as uh, the modern day country, um, he conquered Cyprus and brought it into his empire. 
Now, a question that many people uh, may ask is, is Cyprus Greek? Um, I did mention that, yes, Mycenaean people uh, migrated to Cyprus uh, in the 12th century BC from southern Greece. Um, now, the question arises, are the Mycenaean people actually Greeks? Now, first of all, I have to just mention that Cyprus, before the 4th century BC, was divided into 10 separate kingdoms. And each one of these kingdoms had its own character, had its own royalty, um, and they had their own ethnic makeup as well. Now, some of these kingdoms were Mycenaean, some of them were Phoenician. Phoenicians are the ancestors of um, the modern-day people of Lebanon. And some of them, um, we know them as Etio-Cypriots. Um, Etio-Cypriots were the original inhabitants of Cyprus, who, again, many believe they had um, Semitic origins. Now, we have to underline that when the Mycenaeans came to Cyprus in the 12th century BC from southern Greece, at the time of their arrival in Cyprus, there was no united Greek national identity. There was no state called Greece. Um, they came from persecution at the hands of other tribes in Greece. Um, but these tribes later on, um, they started to come together to develop this um, national Greek identity. And that wasn't until around the 8th century BC. But until then, the Mycenaeans, despite being an Indo-European race, um, they were culturally a lot more African in a way because they were heavily influenced by the Minoan Empire, which was based in, in Crete. Um, so the Mycenaeans did not have a concept of, of a Greek national identity um, at the time that they arrived in Cyprus. Um, the Greek national identity didn't actually start developing in Greece until around um, the 8th century BC. And this identity was not actually exported to Cyprus until Alexander the Great's armies arrived in Cyprus in the 4th century BC. By the time this um, cultural Hellenization of the island took place, the Mycenaean people were already in Cyprus for around 800 to 900 years. Um, however, when the Hellenization of the island did happen, um, the, the Mycenaeans, being that they originate from Greece, um, they took, to it, they took to it very well. However, the non-Mycenaean people, so I'm talking about the Phoenicians and the etio cypriot kingdoms of Cyprus, um, they resisted the Hellenization of the island. They preferred to um, live under the Persians. And um, they were forcefully, you could say, Hellenized, culturally Hellenized. They were assimilated and they had to give up a lot of their um, religious and cultural practices. And gradually, they were incorporated into um, the Greek you could say, um, civilization. Now this is actually interesting because um, at the time that Alexander the Great arrived in Cyprus, um, for the first time Cyprus was brought into the fold of European civilization. Before that, Cyprus was traditionally part of the Levant, part of the Middle East. Um, so um, Greece as, as an empire had to like, actually export their civilization, they had to export their culture and their religion to Cyprus um, because otherwise they had no say in, in the area and they actually had no way of actually um, having a, a, foot, a foothold um, in Cyprus um, without ha having to export their um, culture and, and identity um, by force. Now the Islamic history of Cyprus, I'm just going to go over this very briefly. Um, it started with the dream of the Prophet Muhammad, where he foresaw some of his followers, who were Arabs, um, embarking on a sea journey from Syria um, to Cyprus. Um, my colleagues will tell you more about that um, later. Now, um, when he told his followers of this dream, um, they were a bit surprised because the Arabs, they weren't known to be seafaring people, they were a desert people. Um, however, this dream came true in the year 647, long after the Prophet Muhammad's death. Now, the geopolitical um, approach that the Arabs were taking to this conquest, as well as fulfilling this prophecy, um, their intention was to fulfill another prophecy, and that was the conquest of Constantinople in the year 672. So, 25 years after they arrived in Cyprus, they finally got themselves to Constantinople, and they did this by entering their ships into the Aegean region, which is the sea between Turkey and Greece, and they zigzagged their way up the islands and to Istanbul. They were, they were defeated in Istanbul, 
Um, however, um, the Muslims re retained control of Cyprus for another 318 years between 647 and 965 um, Common Era until the Byzantines um, eliminated their rule of the island. Now, a lot of you may be thinking, well, why don't I see evidence of this 300 years of, of pre-Ottoman Muslim rule in Cyprus history? Um, now, I would argue, um, as an analyst, that there has been a deliberate attempt, historically and even today, to make people forget about this period um, in time. And, and the reason why I believe this is because in the year 1570, um, a year before, um, or the year rather, that the Ottoman conquest of Cyprus started, and the Sheikh al Islam, who is the head Muslim priest of um, the Ottoman Empire, Abu Saud Effendi, um, gave his legal and religious justification for the Ottoman conquest of Cyprus by referring to this period when he mentioned that Cyprus was a home to um, Muslim and Islamic monuments and saints which were destroyed, they were erased, and therefore the Ottoman Empire had the religious obligation to go to Cyprus to restore the religion of Islam on the island. Now the Ottomans, um, they understood what monuments meant to eternalizing um, cultural identity. So the first thing the Ottomans did when they arrived in Cyprus was they started to research and identify the burial sites of uh, Muslim saints and old mosques and um, for example the Hala Sultan Mosque today which was built in the 1700s but the, Mus the Ottomans had identified that burial place and built that structure in order to eternalize um, the Muslim identity and the Muslim claim to that island. Now the reason why, and this is the, the real juice of what I'm saying here, the reason why we as Turkish Cypriots today need to acknowledge this 300 year history, pre-Ottoman Muslim history of Cyprus is because if we deny it, if we forget about it, we are actually delegitimizing our own claims to the island. We are delegitimizing our identity and our rights to the, to the island of Cyprus. Um, however, unfortunately, um, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, many Turkish Cypriots um, began to disown a lot of their, their um, Turkish and Muslim heritage and they allowed a lot of their cultural and religious heritage sites to fall into disrepair <coughs> as they went in search of a new um, modern and secular identity. Now I'm just going to start round rounding up my talk now, I know I've gone over my time a little bit, but I'm just going to kind of uh, relate to you how identity politics and geopolitics um, play together um, in the island of Cyprus. And I'm going to use the example of the Apostolos Andreas Monastery um, in Karpas, in the Karpas Peninsula, which is located in the area circled in yellow on my map. Um, now this monastery was named after the Christian Saint Andrew, um, and there is a tomb um, next to the church, but we can definitely say that that tomb does not belong to Saint Andrew, because Saint Andrew is actually buried in Istanbul. Who the tomb actually belongs to, no one knows 100% for sure. Um, some argue that it's actually a Muslim saint that's buried there. Now, um, this monastery, um, for um, Greek Cypriots at least, has been no more um, holy than any other churches on the island. Um, yes, local people, Turkish and Greek, were visiting the monastery, but it was not seen as a place of pilgrimage from great distances until the year 1996, when Greek Cypriots started to organize pilgrimages from the south um, to the north just to visit this church. Um, now, at the same time, in the peace negotiations that we're having today between um, the Turkey Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots, the Greek Cypriots often cite their claims to the Karpas Peninsula by um, pointing out the Apostolos Andreas Monastery. Um, so it, it carries great geostrategic uh, significance for them. However, when it comes to the Turkish perspective, um, it's very dangerous for Turkey at least to allow the Karpas Peninsula to fall into, um, quote, unquote, um, enemy hands because the Karpas Peninsula is directly located opposite two main seaports on the southern um, Turkish um, coastline, that being Mersin and Iskenderun. Now, um, the Karpas Peninsula, if it was to fall into hostile hands, it could very easily be used to block off access to these seaports. Um, so, if that was to happen, Turkey would not be able to get its cargo ships or warships. Um, in and out of the Bay of Iskenderun, the sea between uh, Turkey and Cyprus, into the open seas. Um, so Turkey 
really needs um, an ally in Cyprus, um, in, in the realistic context as the Turkish Cypriots, to remain in Cyprus to safeguard its interests um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And that's why when the Turkish Republic was first founded, they sent an, an ambassador, their first ambassador to Cyprus was a man called Asaf Bey. And Asaf Bey was actually helping, when he first arrived, he was helping Turkish Cypriots migrate to mainland Turkey. Um, however, after a certain point, Asaf Bey got worried and he wrote a letter to the um, government in Ankara saying that the rate at which Turkish Cypriots are trying to move to Turkey um, has got him very worried because at that rate, he said, soon there would be no more Turks um, left on the island of Cyprus. And the reason why he, he was worried about this was because Asaf Bey understood the geopolitical um, significance of having Turks in Cyprus. Um, and with that, I just want to pass on um, to Mustafa, who will explain a little bit more about the 300-year <coughs> period that I mentioned. And um, I hope that, um, I, I wish I had more time to explain more about the modern-day oil and gas um, issue that is happening in Cyprus today. Um, but I can take those questions um, after the seminar is finished. Thank you very much.